your channel that reached 1 million subscribers. Getting into tech was a very pragmatic decision. When are you done with the computer so we can play Mortal Kombat? What kept you going? I was doing 30, 35 unpaid overtime. I didn't care. Everybody was super shocked. How did you get into tech? DevOps. I just loved being the boss of this Kubernetes cluster. How did the YouTube channel then start? Kubernetes course has 7.7 .7 million views. You haven't seen Team City pipelines before. This is actually super exciting. Live coding with a tool that I haven't checked yet. I haven't even tried <laughs> yeah, to yeah, Google yeah, or yeah, anything. Yeah. Kinkali or Wiener Schnitzel? Kubernetes. One trend you're currently excited about. I do not like AI. Hi, I'm Marco from the Team City team at JetBrains, and today I'm joined by the lovely Nana from Tech World with Nana. Nice to be here. It's great to be here in Vienna. We have a little shitty weather. Can I say bad words? You, you can say, you're supposed to say bad words. We yeah? have a nasty weather today, yes. but welcome to Vienna. Yes, thank you very much. The weather is not much better back home in Munich, yeah? but in any case. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, yourself, um, if you might. I noticed that your channel, that you have your YouTube channel, a couple months ago reached 1 million subscribers and congrats to that. I want to go back a bit and um, how did you get into tech before all of this started? Uh, YouTube started, everything. What did you do? Why tech? For me, tech, getting into tech was a very pragmatic, very rational decision. It wasn't a passion. It wasn't like a huge interest. I have a marketing background, so that's what I studied actually. And I graduated from the university and directly after, um, maybe within three weeks of searching for a marketing role, uh, I realized it was extremely difficult for me. And I, I literally had, had this comparison on a job platform where I saw the, the number of marketing positions and then number of IT positions. And I was like, what is that? That is five times more. And there, there must be something there. And that was literally the trigger for me to um, kind of dig into it and understand what is IT. Obviously, I didn't understand any of the job description because everything was kind of uh, like a foreign language for me. And within a couple of weeks, I decided to apply to a technicum college in Vienna. And then in September, I started, I started my IT studies without knowing what the field was about, whether it's going to be interesting for me or not, um, just completely blind basically. So when you were a kid, there was no whatever, you had a laptop or some uh, or a computer, someone gave it to you and uh, made you play with it. I mean, literally no background in tech whatsoever, marketing studies, full marketing studies. And then... So it was actually, so my, my dad bought a computer. It was a Pentium 4, I think, um, or Pentium 2, I don't remember. And he was actually uh, learning Visual Basic, Visual Basics, I think that was. Um, I still remember. So he was learning this from books by himself. And then he was trying to teach me and my brother uh, to, to explain it to us so that he could retain the information better. And we just wanted to play. So we just were like, okay, okay, when, when are you done with the computer so we can play Mortal Kombat on the, on the computer? I never, I was never interested in that. I didn't care when, when he was explaining to me some, some programming stuff, even though I had contact with, with it, I never thought about the option of getting into programming. So um, probably apart from my father, um, and he was not convincing example for me, I didn't know any programmers or any developers basically, or any engineers. But you had Mortal Kombat to play. Yes. Good game. Good game. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you applied for, what was it called again? The technical college, yeah. uh, so to speak. And you did that. And what, what, was, what was it like? I mean, having had, I mean, a completely different background, so to speak. I mean, were you first bombarded with tons of what is going on here? It was extremely overwhelming. I remember I had, uh, so we started with Java and JavaScript in the first semester. And everybody in my class was either had uh, a technical background, like from work, or they were from HTL, which is a technical um, school. So I was kind of the only one with marketing background, like zero idea, and it was extremely overwhelming. I remember the first uh, exercise we had in Java was to print out Hello World, and our professor would uh, run the test against it and see if, if we passed or not, and I got zero. Um, I couldn't pass, and I had a retake, so she basically gave me another chance to submit, I failed again, and then I was like, okay, I need to, I need to have a strategy here of how I can learn this because um, it was 
it was very overwhelming in terms of the curriculum and in terms of time because we had every single week we had like new concepts and I couldn't catch up. And I, I literally just printed out a 400 page Java book and I started learning every single day, like paper, like page by page, the concepts of functions, the garbage collector, like where everything goes and where it's stored in the memory, um, like all the concepts and the syntax so that I could um, pass the, the course by the end of the semester. What gave you the motivation to do so in terms of, I mean, when, when people usually print out like 400 pages, they do like five pages, 10 pages, 100 pages, maybe then they drop off, maybe lose motivation. Maybe what, what kept you going and not, you know, just dropping out? So I think I, the, the main motivation was definitely that I knew that if I s learn this, I have a very high chance of uh, getting a job or at least an internship, starting with an internship and then getting an experience and becoming an engineer. So that was a big motivation for me. Um, and I was um, very intentionally studying towards that. So my plan was uh, at the beginning of second semester, I wanted to find an internship with the knowledge that I had. Um, so I was learning all the subjects that I, I didn't need for the job. Uh, just enough to pass them. And then I was um, concentrating on Java and JavaScript or generally programming uh, the rest of the time because I knew that I'm going to need those for the internship. So that was the, the main motivation why I was like, I need to learn this conceptually, like on a deep level. I still remember the, the syntax and the functions and the concepts that I read from this page, uh, from, from the Java book till, till today. Did you sometimes feel like, I mean, imposter is a hard word, but I mean, at any point did you think maybe I'm way too much uh, in over my head in, in that whole journey or were you just like, nah, I'm going to do this? Fortunately, I didn't. So uh, I was like, first, the very first thought was how hard can it be? And then I, I saw that it's super hard. And then I was kind of, um, maybe that was my second motivation or trigger because I was like, this is very challenging. And, but I knew that if I worked hard enough and if I like read this book page by page and really, really took my time to study, uh, that I could, I could do it. So I didn't have uh, a doubt of whether I'm going to be able to do it. It was just a matter of time, basically. Let's imagine then you kind of succeeded in learning Java and all of that. That means also you got the internship and uh, all the projects. That means you started working as a software engineer afterwards, and essentially. So at the beginning of second semester, I started my internship. And soon I realized that I was learning much more at the job than in the Fachhochschule or college. So I was uh, actually hired for 20 hours. I was doing 30, 35 unpaid overtime. I didn't care because it was for me an opportunity to learn with actual projects and actual tasks. Um, I think everybody was super shocked. They were like, why is this intern so motivated and committed? Like she's just, you know, taking tasks and, and doing them very quickly because uh, before I was studying at home, but it's really difficult to, to learn stuff yourself when you don't have like this practical application of those things. Like you just, you know, try to find some blog articles and then you get stuck in the, in the, in the middle. Nobody's there to explain to you. So in the internship, it was perfect because I had all these engineers that I can learn from uh, and I had actual like real life projects and tasks that was super motivating for me. So I was kind of using that to learn. And what happened after the internship? I mean, did you, did you continue working as a software engineer for a while? Yeah, so they, they prolonged my internship and then they hired me as a junior developer in the same company. My contract was 20 hours, but I was working much more. So at some point I realized, actually, I want to be work, working full time and be compensated full time. And I applied for four jobs within a week. I got three interviews out of them. The first interview, they hired me in, a, in another job. I got the full time uh, position. I got my work permit in Austria. It was, it was amazing. It was exactly as I had planned it like two years uh, or one and a half years before. It was exactly like next step and the next step as I envisioned or as I planned it actually. That's quite a story because I never had these plans, these rigid plans for like uh, over one, two, three years. But that is interesting to hear. We have uh, the programming universe, then we have the DevOps universe. And um, because I recently wrote an article about Kubernetes and about Docker and stuff like that, when you go, I like O'Reilly, the learning platform where you can access all the books and read through books. When you enter Kubernetes, um, you get like, I don't know, hundreds of books written about it. In terms of it's a huge universe. Now, I know your channel focuses on DevOps. Now, we had that tiny topic of getting into programming from scratch. Now, we have the DevOps world, which is also insanely huge. How did you get into 
DevOps then after programming? The job that I mentioned was actually uh, the full time. It was a JavaScript developer. And very quickly, I found out it was boring for me. Uh, it was just the front end. It was, uh, it, was, I was, it was a game developer role, so it was a lot of pixel shifting. And I realized that is boring because it's, it was very one dimensional. And then I actively searched for a project that basically offered me a, a much larger opportunity to learn, like with lots of new tools, um, lots of different variety of tools. And for me, it was important because I didn't know about DevOps. I didn't know about like different size of IT because when someone, a newcomer thinks about IT, it's just one large blur and that's it. Um, but even in software development, like the tasks are so different that you personally may be interested in one specific thing much more than in, a, in another. So I realized that I needed to test out this different stuff for me to find out like what was interesting. So for example, we had for front end and back end, we had these uh, processes where we were packaging and that process was very slow. And then we would uh, build the application in uh, using a pipeline. So I was always trying to tweak these things like, oh, let's make the pipeline run faster or let's configure this so that um, it's, it's more optimized or it's more efficient. So I was always trying to look for these kind of tweaks instead of like having to develop like a, or write a, a logic or algorithm in the programming. Just to quickly interrupt you, because I think a lot of developers just want to focus on the code and not care too much about where it's being deployed or having to tweak with the configs, but yeah, interesting. And that was perfect for me because we were a team of developers, so we only had developers and most of the developers didn't want to do those stuff that I found most exciting. So whenever we had these daily standups and there was a task of who wants to uh, troubleshoot Jenkins, it's not working, or a Bitbucket um, issue, whatever. And I was like, I would like to do that. And everybody was happy that I was the, the one volunteering. Um, and for me, it was awesome because I, I kind of had my niche within the team of tasks and, and things that I was learning about and I was doing that other people did not have as much knowledge about. So I kind of liked that thing or took pride in that. And then because I had the, so many options of, of different tasks, I realized that I like this kind of stuff much more than just programming and writing code. But then, I mean, okay, so uh, that was the initial, let's say, foray, but you wouldn't have immediately started with a full-blown uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster. And, you know, or was that already in, in the work? No. So we had, uh, the project was Dockerized and we were using Docker Compose to run it. Um, but we were, and it was all running on on uh, on-premise uh, servers of the cli clients. Um, so... At the same time, I was like, even though I was learning a lot in the project, I was doing learning myself. So I was like, oh, there's AWS and there's cloud and all this cool stuff that we're not using, but I would like to learn. So I actually went to my manager and I said, I want to switch to 30 hours because I need one more day in a week. Weekend is just not enough to learn stuff that I want to learn about, which we're not using in the project. And um, uh, I guess they liked my motivation. So they offered me one day uh, in a week for my study. So I would keep my full-time employment. Um, and on Fridays, I was just working on a, on a project. And the, the only request from my manager was, um, he, he said, uh, while you do this AWS thing, can you also please learn and try Kubernetes? There's this tool called Kubernetes and our client may want to do it to run uh, our Docker application there instead of Docker Compose. So could you please also integrate that in your learning? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, it sounds cool. So I was using, again, this real project and I was trying to, to run it in a Kubernetes environment on cloud. Um, and I was using that to learn basically. And I was fascinated. It was so difficult. And I, rem I remember back then, um, there were so little resources about Kubernetes or AWS, and even more the combination of those two. I think I was uh, doing that for six months. Um, every single Friday, I was trying to take this Docker project, which was Dockerized, and run it on a Kubernetes cluster on AWS while learning these concepts myself. And that was my first contact with Kubernetes. And then um, another interesting coincidence was that after the project, I moved to another project as a lead software developer. So I was doing uh, JavaScript. Uh, mostly like Node.js and front-end uh, JavaScript. And in the team, they decided to use Kubernetes or kind of um, introduce Kubernetes as the very first uh, cluster in the entire organization for this project. 
And again, as developers didn't want to do anything with Kubernetes, they just asked her like in a meeting, it was literally just this discussion, who is gonna do it? And I was like, I have a little experience with Kubernetes. Like I did like a little bit with Kubernetes and they were like, okay, so you are gonna do Kubernetes in, in the team. And I, it was, I was a little bit terrified because I was like, what? And this, is, this was gonna be a production cluster. Like they're gonna run the application, uh, a much more complex application in a Kubernetes cluster. And I had to configure this from scratch. Um, but on the other side, I was like, I would much rather do that than programming actually. And I took that immediately as an opportunity. I was so happy about full-time working in Kubernetes and not having to program in JavaScript anymore. So we installed Kubernetes from scratch on, on their uh, so like bare metal servers. And 90% of the time things didn't work. So I had to do like trial and error uh, because nothing was documented. I mean, the documentation is usually the happy path. And then when something goes wrong, you kind of, yeah, we don't have answer for that. So it was, it was a pretty challenging project, but um, I can imagine I was, I was super happy that I could full-time dedicate to Kubernetes. But, but also circling back, I mean, about talking about motivation again, when I did the AWS certificates, for example, and you need to, I mean, it's, it's a super huge, broad spectrum. And you said, yeah, AWS and yeah, Kubernetes, and I have my Fridays, but it's not just like uh, one hour on Friday and then you understand it all. I mean, it's huge topics by itself. Again, motivation. I mean, I just admire the motivation you had, you know, pushing through, even if you had uh, set up time for that to, to be able to learn it. Again, one of the motivations of Kubernetes and why I was fascinated and still am was because it was difficult. Like I really liked the fact that it was so challenging and I liked it even more that I was the only one in the team who was learning and working with this thing that everybody was kind of afraid of, uh, especially engineers who had more experience than me. So I kind of took pride in, the, in, in knowing something that um, other people in the team didn't because we had a lot of expert, like really um, top tier engineers. So I, I just loved being in that position of, I'm kind of, you know, the, the boss of this Kubernetes cluster and I'm kind of in the middle of everybody. And um, and the, the cool, the, another cool thing was that I was doing 100% technical stuff Whereas as an engineer, I had to at least 50% of the time dedicate to learning the product and the features, which was not as technical. It was more like very product specific, um, which doesn't actually contribute to your technical skills and knowledge. So I was actually happy that I, was, I didn't have anything to do with like this product management and uh, product feature meetings and this kind of stuff. So let's say you were, I mean, Kubernetes, you found your spot and you were basically uh, in the middle of it. How did you then think about, well, let's kind of share my knowledge and, and bring it out to the world? I mean, how did the YouTube channel then start? I mean, was that, I mean, you sounded pretty busy. Um, and then it just happened that you created videos about it? Yeah, so it was directly related to Kubernetes, actually, because I was a freelancer in the project, which means when I, um, the, the time was kind of um, over of my um, project and I wanted to move to another project. So I had to do a handover because I was the only one who had been working so intensively with Kubernetes. So I had to hand it over to the internal team. Um, so we had these sessions where I was kind of explaining to these engineers with much more experience than, than I had. Um, and I saw their, um, like, I don't know what the, what the word is, but they were kind of scared of this mysterious, crazy complex tool of Kubernetes. And my job was to basically say, it's not as complex. Like if you understand the basics and the, the, the basic concepts and kind of the components, it's, it's actually not as, as complex. Uh, it may be complex in the background, like how it works, but that doesn't affect you as an engineer because you don't have to do anything with the infra infrastructure and architecture because it kind of works in the background. So that was the trigger for me to realize, okay, I'm here in this huge organization with these super experienced people. And if they have this kind of attitude towards Kubernetes, um, and I was seeing the demand for Kubernetes, I was like, I'm pretty sure that other engineers, especially the one with less experience, would have the same fear. So I, I took, I basically took my textual notes on Kubernetes because I was documenting everything that I was like trial and erroring um, during the setup. And it was tons of things like it's, you have just Kubernetes and then you have every time you want to install a service inside Kubernetes, then it's the integration between those services and Kubernetes. So that's how I, I planned the Kubernetes playlist. Um, as a prerequisite, I started with Docker. So that was the first 
thing basically for YouTube. So we planned um, Docker Kubernetes a playlist tutorial. I had like the entire curriculum plan, like services, ingress, like all the components and architecture. And um, we started posting them on, on our YouTube channel basically. And then you published the first uh, Kubernetes or Docker video, and you probably didn't think much of it all. I mean, were you sitting in front of the P PC and just waiting for viewers of viewer numbers, or how did, how did that go? So it was a combination of um, I didn't I didn't think about starting a YouTube channel. It was for me. I just want this in video format um, out there for engineers to to see, so that they can save themselves some of the pain that I had to go through. So there was literally. Um, we would do the playlist and that was it. So I didn't actually have plans for follow-up videos. Um, but those videos that we posted, those Kubernetes videos, I wanted people to be aware that these videos are out there. So I was, uh, I had deep conviction that people would like those videos. Like I, I was like, they're, you know, people should see this because it's going to help them. So we actually started um, posting these videos in Facebook groups, um, in LinkedIn groups, in Reddit groups, uh, in the in the engineering groups, basically for Kubernetes or DevOps, um, to kind of tell people, hey, here's a video for learning Kubernetes in case you're interested. And that's where we saw the most feedback because we were like, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for. And that's how we get the first views basically uh, to our YouTube channel. But I mean, your videos now have, I guess, millions of views, the most popular ones. How did that, uh, what, what lies in between? I mean, did it just you know, take off like a rocket just by itself? Yeah, so that's where YouTube algorithm comes in. So you have uh, on YouTube, you have this first milestone that you have to kind of break. Um, the milestone is for monetization, but it's really for YouTube algorithm to realize that you are actually serious content creator or, or serious channel um, that is producing stuff uh, regularly. Um, I think it was 4,000 subscribers and 10,000 hours of watch time, something like that. Um, and only then, then YouTube starts kind of, that's how I imagine at least, the alg algorithm kind of starts monitoring your content and seeing, okay, it's just gonna show it to some people on the on the homepage, like a suggestion, and then see like how many people click. I think the first one that went through the roof was, um, either it was Prometheus tutorial or, or Kubernetes, I don't remember. So there was one video, I think it was Prometheus, it just, um, we were actually watching the views. So you have the, the YouTube statistics, which is last 48 hours and then last hour. And I was literally seeing like how many people are watching the, the stuff. And then we had like one day we, we opened the statistics and it was like a huge spike. And that was the Prometheus video. Uh, and that's where I realized, okay, YouTube uh, algorithm kind of picked up one of our videos and it's promoting it to a lot of people who may like it. And the second one was the Kubernetes a full course, which we which now has 7.7 .7 million views on our channel. And there was the those videos were actually the very first ones that uh, we created on the channel. And these are also super long, right? I mean, is it three, three, four, five hours, something like that? It's, it's four hours around. We we talked a tiny bit before about. Um, how long it takes to create these videos or the courses or everything to plan everything out. Your approach is not to have too many videos, not like three videos every week, but rather, you know, focus on one a month maybe. Um, all the topics you present online, do you basically, or you make a video about Prometheus, for example, did you already know everything about Prometheus before you, you created the video or was it basically on the fly learning as you go or how does that work? Yes, yeah, so this is a super interesting thing actually because um, I, I knew Prometheus, I knew Helm, I knew Kubernetes, obviously, the, I, I knew a lot of the things that I created the videos about, but I couldn't rely on my knowledge because the thing is as a practitioner, Often you work with a tool, but you don't have time. Like you have this time pressure, you have you have to deliver, you have to release because the team is wa waiting for it. Often you don't have time to be like, I'm gonna take two weeks now and I'm gonna learn the best practices of uh, Prometheus. I'm gonna learn the architecture, how it works, uh, instead of just focusing on the usage. So I had to actually take a step back and I was like, okay, I've, I've implemented this, but let me check actually, did I do everything correctly? Uh, what was the best practice? What are the different options, for example, of using the tool? There is a reason why each option exists. So what, what is the difference there? So I had to actually do extra research 
to have like a full picture of the thing before I was ready to make a video about it. So it was a combination of you have to be a practitioner, so you have the experience, but that's not enough if you want to explain it or teach it to someone. The same way is probably not enough just to theoretically learn something without having having used the tool uh, in, in practice. So I every single video I created, even with Kubernetes, I had to learn everything, like the entire big picture, uh, before I was ready to create the video. So basically the thing is, I need to learn twice or three times more um, than I would put in the video, because I need to kind of go zoom out and then I can zoom in back so that I know, okay, this is what I need to explain. This is something that is less important or something that they can find out from the documentation. Before we start teaching the tool, what, what is the purpose of this tool? Like why did someone create it? And then you can start thinking about the tool itself, like the features, configuration, the syntax, and this kind of stuff. And by the way, just as a quick side note, I think cutting people underestimate how much knowledge you have to actually cut down and how big that you know upper level view is essentially and how much you have to learn and then spend all that effort and then really cut it down to the well essential stuff uh, later on that ends up in the video and the blog post or whatever we've been talking about kubernetes what's your personal opinion about it in terms of if i was now a startup where i wanted to create something would you say hey marco immediately go with kubernetes or would you go with a simpler tool like ansible or whatever you have i mean whatever is in that space essentially it's not a direct comparison but i mean is it your one go-to tool kit so basically maybe two years ago um i would have said if you are a start, if you're a small startup, if you don't have, like if your infrastructure is not um, as demanding, do not use Kubernetes, go with an easier option. Um, now I would say you can use Kubernetes because it has become so much easier to use Kubernetes with the managed services. I would not recommend to, to do it self-managed, 100% not, especially as a startup, because the operations effort that you have to put in in a self-managed cluster, it just doesn't pay off. Um, if that's not, your business basically take the the smallest um, or relatively smaller worker nodes uh, you can scale it up and down if you don't need it for example so um, i would recommend because it takes away a lot of the operational effort that you would otherwise have if you didn't use kubernetes um, so it kind of automates away the the operation side and i usually um in most startups, you won't have you would have the engineers, the the software engineers, but you won't have a DevOps uh, person or an operations engineer in a startup team because it's just too too small to have that additional expense, so to say. So you can automate that operations person using Kubernetes. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is. Um... Do you do consulting for companies? I mean, in a DevOps space. I mean, do you help them out? Uh, what do you do? Um, so the first consulting request that we got uh, right away was a lot of companies asking for Kubernetes consulting specifically, um, because there were a lot of teams who were struggling with Kubernetes and managers probably didn't know like how to uh, help them, especially um, as I mentioned, there was not too much documented in terms of like the, the not happy path. So we got a lot of requests about that. Um, and then about DevOps, generally how to integrate DevOps in, in existing um, processes, uh, because introducing DevOps in an existing older or out, more outdated in system or architecture is more difficult than starting it from scratch. Um, so there were a lot of companies also requesting us uh, or requesting Nana or me, uh, basically, uh, to uh, help the team or usually developers team to understand the concept first, the, the DevOps, and then help them uh, optimize their processes. Because um, usually what, ha what would happen is the engineers would watch the videos and then they would go to the manager and say, we need Nana to help us with this thing because we don't know how to move forward. So uh, some of the examples, example projects that I've done is uh, going to a um, team that had an existing process with like Jen Jenkins CI CD and um, some kind of existing infrastructure and basically looking at their system and um, coming up with a plan of how they should uh, optimize the processes using DevOps, like automate stuff, uh, maybe change some of the tools and integrations so that it's more streamlined. Um, and my job was to not only tell, because in, in DevOps, you can optimize things endlessly, like there is no almost no end, but you usually have limited resources in a team. You have 
set of, set of engineers and usually their their time is not dedicated to optimizing and automating things because they need to develop new features and fix bugs and, and stuff like this. So my job was not only to come up with a plan, but also to kind of evaluate what uh, optimizations were more priority, what were, so the kind of uh, return on investment on each of the optimization and automation uh, steps to tell them, okay, don't worry about uh, automating this, do not worry about introducing Terraform because it doesn't give you as much benefit at the end, but uh, make sure to have this automated monitoring setup because you need that more often. So kind of give them this kind of um, high level uh, architectural suggestion. And then we would have like weekly meetings where the team would try to uh, implement them. And if they got stuck, they would basically come to, back to me and say, okay, we don't know how to proceed here. We don't know which option to use. Um, so then I would help them in our implementation basis, basically uh, in addition. So I, I liked um, doing, or I still like doing this kind of more high level architecture design um, stuff, because I think it's very valuable to the companies. You You have, more engineers that can just go and implement stuff, um, uh, a specific task, but you have uh, less or fewer engineers that can look at the entire thing in, in Unity and then have, have the knowledge of maybe 20 different tools and then decide, put the Lego boxes or Lego stones together and say, this is how the end product or end uh, architecture should look like for your specific project. Um, and I think there it's also especially valuable to tell them not what not to do, what not to optimize because it's not going to pay off or it's not going to be as good of invested time. Do you find some, some, some common pain points that people actually have? I mean, across companies when it comes to, you know, DevOps pipelines and CICD and anything like that? Yeah, so the, the major pain point is basically making sure that everyone um, and usually DevOps affects a lot of different roles and teams. So those teams have the same kind of understanding of DevOps. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why in practice, even though it was not meant like this, DevOps engineer became its own role. Because what happens is that you have this overarching uh, set of principles or guidelines that tell that uh, software developers, operations engineers, security engineers, testing engineers, they have to work together, um, plus uh, Scrum Master and product owner and all these teams, uh, all these roles have to work together. And usually um, those those different roles have their own immediate tasks and, and set of um, responsibilities. And it's, it's very easy to kind of focus on that and it's difficult to zoom out every now and then and see the big picture like, oh, who needs my help? Who, who, who I can uh, collaborate with? And that's why you have this orchestrator, basically, someone on the top that keeps uh, track of um, how the DevOps process is implemented or being implemented in the whole, whole organization and how different teams work together and share the knowledge. Because um, when you think about DevOps is everything is like from these silos, you basically take every sp specialized knowledge and you spread it and integrate it in the entire life cycle of software development and uh, deployment. So you take soft the security part and you say, it's not just your thing to be, to do the security checks at the end and compliance checks. We're going to take a set of your knowledge. We're going to automate part of it. And then the rest of it, we're going to integrate into into different parts of the pipeline, starting from the very left um, in every single stage. So it's not concentrated in one team, but it's kind of built into the entire system. And you do the same thing with uh, automated testing. You do the same thing with operations and monitoring and, and software development practices. So um, that's, the, that's the main pain point in all the organizations to have this kind of understanding to even um, kind of evaluate, are they doing the DevOps integration or introduction right? Or how can they do it better? Because it, it's, it's, it's good that it's flexible and vague, but then it becomes difficult in the implementation. And at the end of the day, do you feel that people or companies or actually people, because it's a people problem, so to speak, they are, do you see a, a huge willingness then to, to really change and, you know, accept that kind of broader view set? Or uh, uh, do you also get some pushback on, on certain ideas or just from your experience? 
It really depends on people. Um, it depends certainly on how the company is built, like how the culture is built, whether they are pro like more reluctant to changes or more welcoming of the change. And it also very much depends on the engineers. You often have these engineers with very uh, large experience that are used to working in a certain way, the old way. And now you're coming here and you're saying, now we're going to do everything in a completely different way. So forget all the principles and concepts that you've learned. You have to relearn new stuff. So, so um, naturally, they are more resistant uh, compared to if, if you have a junior engineer and you're like, this is how we're going to work. They're so like, sure, why not? Like, not, not a problem at all. So it's, it depends on, on the people and generally like how the organization is introducing different types of changes uh, generally. I feel like we could go on and on about pain points and stuff, but I just wanted to kind of finish up by asking you, do you see any sort of trends, technologies, tools, frameworks happening in the DevOps space right now where you think that would be interesting for people to find out about, to look into anything that comes to mind? The way I look um, at the industry and try to evaluate different trends and stuff is I always look at what is the the thing that's still missing, what it's not fully addressed, and then think about, okay, what are the tools actually that are trying to solve this problem? I think the CD part is still, I mean, a lot of it is, we have lots of different tools. We have the push base, pull base, different types of things. Um, and right now, I think the, the biggest thing that should happen long-term is to kind of standardize things, because now we have opened up lots of different things. We have tools that kind of do the same thing, but they have this additional feature and this one has these different capabilities. So we have lots of things going on and the DevOps fields, cloud field is very dynamic. And um, so I think long-term we need kind of stabilization and standardization of the processes because every time you introduce new tools, you have to think about all the integrations that you have to do for that tool, right? And it's a huge ecosystem. Um, I see a lot of, um, a lot of Technologies trying to become this one-stop shop for a lot of the, the things, so you don't have to think about integrations, like um, you know, offering the pipeline and then integrating Docker registry within that pipeline and um, integrating the authentication mechanisms to all the different uh, deployment environments, which I think is much more convenient and it should be the trend because it just. I, I'm super excited whenever the integrations and things get complex, but it doesn't mean that it should be like this because then it's an operational nightmare because you have to think about, um, and whenever you think about integration, it's not just to make it work, but how do you make sure it's securely integrated, right? Uh, anytime you have to uh, give something, a system uh, credentials to another system, like how do you make sure to manage those credentials and and we have to think about a lot of different uh, tools and I think the the ideal thing is to make the number of tools uh, smaller in the entire system I'll tell you what Nana thank you very much for uh, for uh, sharing your insights and all of that I found it uh, to be very interesting and uh, it was a pleasure and we'll just continue with I'll show you a couple of things um, and let's see how you find them and what your uh, opinion is on those things so we have Team City. We have been working on Team City for I think 18, 18 years, something along those lines. And we recently renewed, uh, released a new, let's say, version of it, which is called Team City Pipelines. We try to simplify the user experience because, as with you know all these older CI/CD tools, essentially they have tons of features, and Team City is very powerful. But the complexity from a user perspective at some point grew also with the with, with that feature set. And now we're just trying to take a fresh look at what could Team City look like with a much simpler UX UI uh, experience, uh, still based on these powerful features. And that is what Team City Pipelines is. You haven't seen Team City Pipelines before. And what we'd like to do is, uh, let's say, a quick user test, right? Uh, find out um, how you like it. How, I mean, if you, if you can navigate around and so on and so forth. And for that, I prepared a tiny project. It's a Java project, a Java Maven project. You can build it with a Maven package. Uh, we need to have two jobs. I wanted to create a pipeline that has two jobs. The first one builds the project. Uh, the second job gets the, the jar file in this case from the first job and just uh, 
you know, prints out that it received, you know, the jar file, and then we'll, you know, make it more complex later on. Hence, um, I'm just going to be watching over your shoulder, so to speak, uh, and trying to figure out, um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you manage, you know, uh, to, to, to create that pipeline and how easy it is. And uh, that, that will be the goal. Cool. This is actually super exciting. Live demo, live coding with a, with a tool that I haven't checked yet. Super exciting. And we're not lying. You haven't. You haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even tried yeah, to Google or yeah, anything. Yeah. So I'm not yeah, yes. completely fresh perspective. And this is, by the way, the, the new user's perspective. So we just set, an, set up an account for Nana. Um, welcome to Team City Pipelines. That's what you will see also when you create an account uh, where you can create a new project, a new pipeline. And uh, off we go, uh, essentially. The project is called A New To Do List. It's kind of my project that I always use for any sort of demos. I just build to-do lists. Let's give it a go. And I'll just, maybe just as a bit of background. So most tools nowadays, they use YAML-based configuration and you could also, you know, use YAML-based configuration uh, with, with TeamCity pipelines. Um, it would be a bit boring to show you now, you know, copy and pasting <laughs> just YAML snippets. Hence, we also have a visual editor. That would, that yeah, that would have been actually my first thing to look for because most of the tools have YAML and I usually use YAML, but, um, first of all, if you're working with a new CI CD tool, you have to kind of get the boilerplate syntax of the YAML. And I always appreciate when I have the boilerplate either from the tool or from somewhere else that I can just use. So I would actually use the UI to get the boilerplate and then tweak it in the YAML. So that would be my um, cool, yeah. way of... Let's see, today, hopefully there's not going to be much YAML tweaking you need to do. <laughs> so yeah, let's go to the visual uh, editor and see if you kind of find a way around where you add what's happening. What's going okay. on, that sort of stuff. So we have job one, mm -hmm. uh, and you can add multiple of them. That's very intuitive. Let me. And you could just, I don't job. know, give it any name, build backend, build something. Yeah, let's I call don't know. this build, let's call this deploy. Another thing, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm starting from the high level. So I yes. see these dependencies, and I'm assuming then that, so the same way you have the stages in, in pipeline where the stage automatically means that the, the jobs get executed in a specific order, I would make this depend on build. So it creates the pipeline. That's my intuition mm -hmm. or assumption Yeah, that, that kind of worked, yeah. Um, to make sure that this completes first before deploy yeah. gets executed. Um, all right, and then we have steps, multiple steps, I'm guessing. Yes, so we can add steps, run on. Okay, so another thing is, of course, my first question would be, where is this thing gonna run on which machine? Um, again, I'm guessing there are shared runners that kind of Team City pipelines provide, so I don't have to set up my runners myself, and that's where the job will get executed. And just from my knowledge of other um, CI/CD pipelines, I'm assuming each job will run in its own um, fresh new environment, so to say, uh, which means anything that we want to make available, the, the jar file that we're gonna try to make available for deploy job, we would need to. Um, be passed on as an artifact or um, in some other way. So anyway, so I see run on on Linux medium. That is fine. I see the artifacts. I like your okay. assumptions. I'm not, try I'm not trying to help you out. I, I don't know. I don't know. All right. So we have the repository. So we have yeah. a list of pre-installed software on the... So I'm assuming you have this uh, preparation steps. So if you want to execute Maven or whatever you have... Um, an option to install, but I see the project has Maven wrapper. Um, so let me, let me, so working directory. Okay, so oh, this, this is a good one. So you can choose uh, if you want to switch directory and then script contact. Okay, this looks running Docker. Okay, so you can run it in the isolated yeah, By the way, you can also you can click on any, anything you like. I yeah, mean, uh, hopefully it's one. not going to break. Um, <laughs> I mean, I am, I'm a, f I like the, the running. Um, builds in Docker container because it makes sure that the machine, even though it's, it gets refreshed, stays clear and clean. Um, and and it's by very the way, isolated. feel free to yeah. kind of click it. So Docker image, um, I'm going to choose Maven. <laughs> this, okay, so I'm going to choose Maven because we have the Maven, uh, the working directory. If I, if I leave this empty, I would assume the root will be taken. So let's try. Uh, this is Maven goal, right? So we have, we can execute multiple uh -huh. um, commands. I actually do not remember the 
the Maven uh, commands. I think it's package. Yeah, it's package. Not? Yeah, okay, package, so you it's need, not... package you need okay, to do. Yeah. Got it. Home location is the root. So. That's fine. Actually, the that's default, a tiny hint that the field shouldn't be there. Yeah. should be hidden kind of as an okay. advanced option. But yeah, the default works. Uh, so I'll just I'm assuming the... whenever I leave empty, it's going to take root. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, let's. I'm going to try to run this in Docker. So we just need Maven, actually. But I'm not sure that we... Okay, so the, the project is using Maven wrapper. Um, do you know, by the way, what, what's your assumption what that Maven wrapper is? What does it do? So that means we, you don't need Maven installed, actually. So I could potentially just do uh, Maven wrapper and package or something right, like that. Right, I understand. OK, I see. Aha, like that. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <Yeah. laughs> Interesting choice now. <laughs> um, and that would mean, actually, you know what? Let me try like this. Um, let, me, let me try Alpine. Because I don't need Maven in the image if I'm using Maven wrapper. I was just saying you could also try without the Docker image. I mean, uh, assuming that the Maven wrapper is in the repository. Could, I mean, I'm not trying to influence you, but okay. that, well, let's see either way. Yeah, <laughs> what, what, what's going to happen? I assume it should work in in both cases, yeah. whether yeah. with or not. So we have relative path to file, so we don't need to specify the file. And I need to remember where that jar file gets generated. Yeah, so and it, I don't. The, the target yeah. subfolder. So target uh, is the subfolder. Ah, okay. uh, from, yes, and then target. There is a and I forget the name. You can just use, use a wildcard, uh, okay. uh, like uh, dot jar. Uh, so uh, wildcard dot jar. That should work. Let's let's put it like that. Okay, so this will generate the jar. That means I don't need a separate step. It just does it with artifacts, and. I think that would be it. Do we have to save this? I think this is... You I, have would, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't you know. have unsaved changes. Let me let me check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let me check what this is. So optimizations, parallel tests. Okay, we don't have multiple tests here. Sparse, sparse checkout. What is that? What do you Checking think it does? Working directories only. Okay. So we... Oh, okay, so this, this would be good for microservices. Um, if you're just building one microservice or maybe back and front end separation uh yeah. that's that's the plan kind of okay. for that feature yeah reuse yeah. job results what is that so this is an interesting one. so it will reuse the results of the last job run the results being uh so if it builds the jar file it's not going to do it again is that the the yeah exactly if, if, if nothing if nothing changes if the if source nothing, code doesn't okay. change it kind of um, but what we could do is, I tell you what, why don't we just, you know, run the whole thing? Let's see what happens. Let's see if it breaks or let's see if, if I don't know, stuff explodes. Yeah. Okay, so let me let me echo this. All ah, right, yeah, true. We need the, the deploy job also. And deploy job, as we said, you don't really need to do anything, maybe just an LS. Uh, so we see that the, the jar file kind of yeah. got, got transmitted. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to LS target directory. Okay, yeah. Let's see. Uh, run Let's see on what happens. Linux machine. And by the way, do you now think that the file just gets transmitted, so to speak? I mean, do you think that? Um, what what's your impression there? That um, oh, there's a use artifacts option. Right. I totally did not <laughs> steer you in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> so logically thinking, the the because of the dependency on build, it's gonna download the artifacts. Yes. So. I'm assuming in, in the background, this job, the build job will upload the artifact because that, that's what we're configuring here. Yeah. Um, basically this artifact and this one will download it because I just chose use artifacts. <laughs> and then the question is how it's gonna be uh, accessible in this environment. Yeah, that's so it's gonna nice. download the jar file. Um, I know, it's, we, it's, can, we can just give it a try. It's just going to download the jar file, not the target folder. So I don't have a target folder. Okay, I'm going to print out everything because I would want to know what is in my current directory. Yes. And yes. if, yeah, that would be interesting to, so, to know where, in one which path the artifact gets downloaded. Yeah. Okay, let's run let's, this. Let's figure it out. <laughs> let's, let's run, run it. Let's see what happens. Let's All see right. what happens. What yeah. you'll need to do now is on that screen, on that run screen, see if you find an Easter egg. 
Mm. I will try to steer you into some sort of direction, but do you, I don't know, when you move your mouse around, do you think there's anything anywhere you can find something happening? <laughs> let's, let's see if, you, if there is. A, <laughs> there's a lot of things It's happening. not immediately visible. That's why, we, we, I mean, there's no way you will would just know. You'll have to kind of like a, conquer the screen with your uh, mouse. I mean, let's see if something pops up. If there's nothing, then there's nothing. Like a, on a mouse over? Okay, let's take the Easter egg for the next okay. run. Yeah, because we're going to have one more run. Let's try and figure out what let's the... Let's see. Let's do the troubleshooting now. Yes. Why the first job actually failed and why it's... All right. What, what happened here. And uh, it could be... Right. Let's see. Permission denied. Ah, oh, permission okay. denied. Yes. Got it. It's unfortunate. You have to uh, ch mod um, the thing into an executable. Yeah. Okay. And just to give you as an expectation for, for it, I mean, in, in the real world... Editing yeah. pipelines is not the most fun and enjoyable thing, but now we're going to try to make an enjoyable experience for the viewers. <laughs> so yeah. let's see what happens. Okay. Um, Auto save. That could run, yes. that could work, and now we have some more time to find the Easter egg again. Okay. <laughs> and then okay. I'll have to go away at the end if you don't find it. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So I need to interact. It's you not need, just yeah, it's visible. Yeah, it's just hovering. Oh. Oh, there, there was something. There was something. There was something. I think you're on the right on the right track. There was some. <laughs> there was. Wait, some. <laughs> I just saw like a blip. <laughs> yes, there was. Come on. Yeah. Uh, Come on now. Yeah, there was something blipping. Yeah, there was something blipping. Okay, you have to tell me yep. up or yep. down up, or left. Up, up, maybe a tiny up. bit. Up, up, up. Let's see a tiny bit left. Let's uh -huh. see. There is. Aha. Oh, okay. Aha. There yes. you go. Take okay, a break. Take a break. Let's see what. Aha. And now the build is again. Okay, let me do it one, once again. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> take a break. The, the, Join yes. the numbers and get to 2000. Yes. Wow. And it's a bit, I mean, because oh, we yeah. zoomed in and because it's on the screen, but it's okay. actually, we put in a tiny game because for long running jobs and whatever, uh, we ah. just wanted to make sure that people, instead of staring at the build log, they could also have a tiny game to play. Okay. I've tried it a couple of times. That's my old anecdote, and I never managed to to, to make it anywhere close to, to uh, 48. Ah, but, okay, um, okay. I get it. Yes. And then, and then I have to... Yeah, you have to merge these cells, and then at some point you run out of... I think I've played this kind of thing once. You have to merge the same numbers. Okay, yes. I get it now. Yes. I'm getting a grasp. And then at some points. And we already ap apologize if we make um, I'm sorry. De DevOps engineers <laughs> kind of... I got of... distracted now. <laughs> I, got, I got distracted now. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's you're, you're done. 296, let's see. You're still, still, oh, work that's a, that's you're a, still working that's on it. Ah, yeah, there yeah. Was a, but now was game over. Failure. 328 still congrats <laughs> congrats right let's have a tiny look okay. at the deployed job and let's see what the deployed job um if that this may be a distraction for engineers yes it may this game. yes yes <laughs> okay so we have success that's good success yeah uh let me uh okay oh I mean, yeah by the way the also by the way sorry i didn't want yeah. to you can feel free to click uh whatever you just wanted to click i mean i didn't want to 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 interrupt you from from there yeah i'd really like to do like analysis of like what what I'm able to see afterwards. So let, sure, me, see, yeah. let me see. So we have the build logs. It's all right. And Important uh, messages. Again, we're that? trying to make the, the build log ah. um, as enjoyable as possible. It's pretty, I mean, it's collapsible. Uh, these, sorry, because you don't have any different error message types at the moment, but okay. we try. So I can, I can filter out the errors. Yes. That, that's good. Yes. Because depending on what you're executing, obviously it can be a lot of input. Uh, so important messages, so it has to decide, obviously, by itself. What yes. Important is yes. Soft. Okay. That's also fine. And okay. then it, you can also download it, obviously, and just, mm. you know, see what's going on. And then we have the artifacts. Yeah, artifacts. Hopefully results. you should see something ah. uh, familiar there. Yeah. And it looks like All it right. found the jar file, kind of. No, that's the deploy. So let's see if... Let's see what happens let's with see the deploy. Yeah. Here. So... By the way, is, is your first, you all already almost clicked maximize view with the build log because you basically want to see the build log in full screen, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see our ls command. Let's see what it is. Here. Let's see what happens. Publishing artifacts, build finished. So let me see, in directory. 
target. Oh, okay, so we yeah. did uh, download the whole target. Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do one change now. One change, and then you have more time for the game. By the way, ah, if you rerun okay. it, yeah, and then we're <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me yes take the target and let's see what happens. Right. So we should actually be reusing the first exactly that we should be reusing the first part of the of the build because the jar file hasn't changed. So you have auto cache. Uh, that's good. So that is an optimization we have, mm -hmm. and we're trying to to put in these optimizations uh, in the product without you having to worry about them essentially or to configure them manually. And oh yeah, let's see what the deploy job does. Did the command did uh, right? Did it just close down? Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it looks like um, it looks yeah, like that. So we have our jar it looks like there. that kind of worked yeah this is actually this is a good thing because usually you have to explicitly configure caching because you almost always need optimization um, whether it's downloading the dependencies or um, building a, a package and you have to specify the dependencies always and artifact configuration so it's actually good that you can do it with one click yes now uh, i would actually like to check the yaml Oh, yes, please go ahead. Have a look at Let's the YAML. See. Let's see if it makes sense. Let's see. Yeah. So this is <laughs> YAML. That's that's um, this simple already. Yep. So we have uh, the jobs. We have job one. And, and this is obviously this. you could just put it into a file into the repo and then yeah. that works. But we also put it into the editor too. Mm. So you see what's, what's happening. Job one steps. Script content. Okay. This is pretty easy. Runs on. Okay, so this is the uh, artifact configuration. Yes, yeah. Dependencies. Shouldn't be too many surprises, actually. Hopefully. Simple. Yeah, and simple. straightforward. Simple and straightforward. Could I get you to do one more thing? Could I yes. maybe rerun the pipeline again with some sort of a change? Uh, sorry to the pipeline. Um, so maybe to the first job, so we, we have some more time basically mm -hmm. until it builds. So again, just put an echo hello or as, a, as a third command or whatever it is. Okay. And then we'll have a look at the, the run page again. Uh, not the game this time. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see if we find something else uh, okay. on that page. So yeah. we run now. Yeah, please go All ahead and right. run it, yeah. Um, did you ever in the past, like, how did you debug pipelines? If something is, you know, broken, how did you kind of access, try and find out what, what's happening or what's going wrong? So obviously error messages. And then if yeah. possible, try whatever that script that we're executing, if it doesn't depend on the pipeline, mm -hmm. try to execute it locally uh -huh. to see like what, what that command is doing. Um, because you want to avoid the, the feedback loop, obviously, if it's dependent on the pipeline, um, trial and error, try to kind of um, tweak stuff and okay. the commands. Yeah. Let's see if you can open a direct access to the build agent where the build is running, and then I'll tell you a mm. bit more about it, uh, okay. how, that, how that kind of works. Let's see if you find an option somewhere on that screen. Um, so to, to connect with, oh, this one probably. Let's see what, let's see what happens. So, ah. yeah, let's see. So I'm a Team City user. That's the, okay, so that's the agent. So I have, I still have the agent after the build, right? Yes, yeah. That's good. I mean, you have different choices, but okay. uh, in this case, yeah, you have the agent available ah. uh, after the after the agent. And at the moment, we put yeah. in this terminal, and you ha again, you're staying in the visual editor. I mean, you don't have to leave the product and now and uh, do, do some connections with some other tool. But um, in the first step, we now give you the agent terminal. Mm -hmm. Next step is hopefully debugging breakpoints where you can you know, set a breakpoint on your script that you want to run. And then the pipeline just holds at that specific you know, stage. Okay. And you can really find yeah. out what, what is currently going on and, and um, uh, debug your pipeline, essentially. This is uh, nice because uh, like most of the issues that I can think of that happen in pipeline is you cannot find a file, you can find the, or the location is wrong or um, some some file or configuration is wrong. So usually you have to do LS and then yes. echo and yes. print out. Um, so it's good that you can go inside and see basically. So I would have actually, I could have spared myself the LS. I could have seen, okay, this is the folder that gets uploaded and whatever is in the folder. Exactly, yeah, that's that's the plan. That's and as we talked about before, um, developers don't necessarily like spending too much time in their CI tool and they would just want yeah. to see stuff running and with as little breakage as possible. So we were just checking out the, the terminal window and our plan is you know, to make it as simple as possible to find out what's, what's happening uh, on the agent and being able to debug the agent. Could you do me one tiny favor? When you scroll to the top, 
uh, it has a theme system and we I, I don't know took you know deep care of our developer minded people uh, who wanted to have a dark theme so could we just switch to mm, dark theme for now yeah. and then yeah let's see <laughs> that, that is cool <laughs> do you, do you yourself good. prefer dark uh, yes. dark themes or yeah so when i when i record um tutorials i switch to white because it just looks yeah. easier um on the screen but for private mode yeah i, I use dark well, whenever I made videos, I first did them in, in, in dark theme and then people complained it's a bit hard to read uh -huh. and then I yeah. switched to, uh, to light theme and then people complained and saying, hey, dark theme is so much better. So we have the, we have the dark theme. Uh, one tiny thing I want you to steer towards too, there's this optimization section. Could you just quickly hover over it and what you, what you or maybe click it and, and see what it, what it does or if it does anything? Okay, so we have the duration. Mm -hmm. um, we're using jobs. So it's off. Could you please rerun the job and let's see what happens? Because we just changed uh, the command. Now it says optimization is on. So we have in queue. So it was in queue for one second and then yeah. the run duration. Do we have this? So this is for the entire pipeline, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, or wait. Yeah, okay. So we have the breakdown per job. So the run duration and then we have the, the pipeline. Oh, and it shows you how much time you saved with the optimization. Yeah, it shows you how much That's time good. you saved. Mm -hmm. Do you just mind quickly going through the optimizations on what you kind of make of them or what do you think uh, these optimizations do? Um, yeah, so wait, we had more options here. Yeah, wait more. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, parallel tests, that's definitely like if, if we have test um, stage, I would call this test stage where um, you have multiple tests, like you want to run them at the same yeah. time because they don't have dependency. The sparse checkout, okay, we, we said, so this makes sense if you have either multiple like mini applications, like microservice yeah. kind of thing, or um, front-end, back-end, or multiple front-ends, multiple back-ends. And then we have, yeah, the, the, the auto-caching is good because usually this is actually more configuration than the artifacts in, in other yes. GitLab, yeah. in other like CI CD pipeline jobs. And I do not like configuring caching because it almost never works because you have to like make sure that the comments are um, like precisely correct. So that this is a huge, huge thing. Um, and then, yeah. And maybe. maybe if you run, sorry, if you click run again, and so just we get to the run page again into this optimization center, because again, one of the things what we wanted to try and do is that not only when you configure things uh, that you, you know, see the optimizations that you can basically enable, but also when you run the pipeline and that after a while, you essentially, you have the, this so-called optimization center. And when you click on it here on this, on this link on mm -hmm. optimization on, that it also shows you kind of, hey, there's a couple of other things you could put potentially um, enable then we just put the click of a button and just keeping you updated all the way and not you know you don't have to learn explicitly about the feature yeah. but it's just being presented to you so to speak that's what we're trying to do that's right because some like the optimization is the afterthought usually so you just get it to work and then you think about okay now we need to ca the caching yes, yeah. the, the other optimizations um, so having this like a more prominent feature that's that's definitely a good idea Let's, yeah. let's see one more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, could you switch the script to uh, the Maven runner? Let's see. Yeah. And um, then, you know, try clean package again. And then something just also popped up on your screen. Um, let's see if you, what, what you kind of make of the message that popped up, or if you even see the message that popped up, uh, popped up so on your screen. So once I switched? Yes. Okay, let me try it again. Let's see what, what happened. Oh, this thing, use parallel tests for... Uh, let's see what does it does. You can also feel free to set up parallel goals. tests if you want to. Yeah, let's give it a try. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. so I have a different optimization. Okay, let me yes. check here. Specify the maximum number of batches for parallel test execution. Yeah, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Okay, can I do three? Yeah, you can do okay. three. Yeah, Let, let's see if that works. Even if we have three tests, let's see if there are, yeah. there are three tests in the project or if there's less tests. But again, what we try and do is, so when you when you ran the script early on, when, when you had the script mm -hmm. runner, 
Um, you can run your scripts, but with Maven and Gradle, it's not just a Maven wrapper, for example, mm -hmm. but we also offer you, hey, we can automatically split the tests in your project for you without you having to change the code. Um, and just, again, clicking a button or you know a slider in this case, and then um, it should just work automatically. So we're trying to be smart about it and uh, understanding your project and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what should happen. Let's see what it did. Yes. Maven. Okay, so we have downloading the dependencies. This, yeah. And could you, by the way, also have a look at the, yeah, sorry, uh, at that test tab, there's also a specific, a specific oh. test tab if we by basically executed these tests, yes. And um, we should actually have executed them separately. What is this? Copy it. Yeah, and here what oh. you see, um, test history, uh, we're trying to keep track of the mm -hmm. test history, um, giving you nice overviews uh, and that sort of stuff. Now let's see what the tests do. So even if you're running, uh, because my my thought was initially you, you have unit tests, you have integration tests, maybe you have some security mm -hmm. tests, so you can parallelize those because yes. they maybe need different tools, whatever. So this is actually, if you have 100 unit tests or 100 integration tests, then running them in parallel yes, in, exactly. in different. Okay. And what we uh, what we do is really just after the uh, the first test run or so, we try to get a list of all your integration tests and unit mm -hmm. tests that you ran. And then if you say I want to have it split by three, we just literally split them by three, mm -hmm. run them on separate jobs, yeah. and you don't have to do extra configuration for it. It sh should just work. That's the idea behind it. That's nice. Yes. So it automatically splits it and, and exactly. distributes it. Exactly. And you get nice. a unified test result mm -hmm. back at the end of the day. So in the, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is for people who want to, you know, get started with pipelines first, uh, have a nice visual editor where you don't necessarily have to, uh, again, read documentation and be distracted with different tools or whatever, just in one screen, uh, and then just, you know, get automatic prompts and, and help messages along the way and helping you, you know, with, with these smart features. Yeah, so I think like compared to other CI/CD tools that I usually work with, I, th I think the biggest advantage here is that you don't have to switch to Google and start looking for information here. You kind of have all of that integrated. So you kind of have like a roadmap when you're getting started with the UI. And then as I said, like if you have some advanced things that you don't find in UI, you can tweak the YAML. But for maybe 80% of the use cases for building like a simple, um, or maybe even more, like even if you want to build like the DevSecOps pipeline with like multiple uh, tools, like you have all the information, I feel like in the in the UI that kind of guides you. Okay, I mean a lot of them is into intuitive, and if it's not, like you you can use again the tool to troubleshoot and test. And I like this this agent um, connection feature actually because you can do a lot of troubleshooting there as well. Yeah, that was the plan. Would you now basically the first time, as you said yourself, you would just you know configure it in the UI and then probably uh, once it's committed as a file, uh, just go and change it in the future in, in the file or would you personally go back to, to the editor? I mean, the visual editing at some point. I would always have it in YAML because um, I just like the fact that even if I don't change the YAML to have a, a configuration because you have uh, reliability if you, Maybe um, if something happens with the UI configuration, you have it in the configuration file, which is uh, backed up, it's in repository. Um, and so that's one. And generally I like the concept of trying to uh, code everything, every kind of configuration, even if you have it in the UI. So have that as an extra. So I would definitely do that. I would have it in the repository. I would maybe communicate with the team that the changes should be done in UI and then resaved it in the uh, YAML and then um, kind of commit it to, to the repository. Got it. Just one last thing, maybe viewers think that pipelines have to be linear. Could you just quickly add a third job, yeah. um, which uh, runs in parallel to build and just does echo, I don't know, build front end or something else, uh, something like that. So we just show viewers that you can build pipelines of any complexity and yeah. of any, uh, thing. I mean, you can just run script echo, hello, I don't know what, whatever you'd like it to, to do. Um, and then uh, it can depend on exactly. So deploy can depend mm -hmm. on this job as well. I mean, you can build it any any way you like. Now it would just run as its separate job, so to speak. Okay, uh, so let's write this one. So it, it 
so this will this two will run in parallel the, these two will okay. now run in parallel yes. yeah and if you had a dependency also from deploy to build number two it would mean it that i mean wait. it could also run yeah. after both of them have run so uh so there's uh, endless possibilities so to speak by the way from your experience how many jobs do build pipelines have usually? I mean, do you see like huge, crazy, complex um, pipelines being built, or, or rather on the on the smaller end, or what's? Not really. So I'm I'm usually a fan of having one task per job because then if it fails, I know exactly this was the test and not package, for example. So I would I would split them up, um, but in practice. The, the pipeline doesn't really end up uh, complex, like with lots of dependencies and stuff, which is a good thing because you have this, so you have the test phase where you can run all the tests um, and then you have, the, like depending, I would say, depending on how automated your tests are that test different aspects of the application, uh, you can add more stages because then you, you, you're deploying in stages. So you have the um, streamlined, deployment till development environment, and then you want to do some automated tested, uh, testing, uh, and then you have maybe some SLA tests, and then you have the staging, and then you do some more tests. So depending um, at what stage, how many automated tests you have, it can get larger, but a lot of teams just do manual testing in between. So they may be deploying to development stage, and then they do manual testing, and that trigger another pipeline that is as simple as just deploying to the staging or, um, yeah. But even if you do have it streamlined, like all the way to pre-production or production uh, with like manual trigger at the end, it, it still doesn't get complex and, and super like uh, difficult to have an overview. Now, when you look at the build, uh, sorry, at the build job, it has the parallel icon. So you see basically a green, oh, so the okay. green check mark. Could you just click it? It try to split it up into different, uh, into different uh, jobs running in them in parallel. Uh, and it didn't make three batches because we only have two tests. Uh, so we have two, yeah. two classes. So you only get yeah. two batches. Uh, exactly. You see the tests, you know, uh, for every batch uh, being executed. Mm -hmm. And again, you didn't have to change code or anything. It just kind That's of worked nice. out of the box, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have the unified view, and then you have the split up. View yes, as well. exactly. Yeah. Nice. From my side, any last impressions, so to speak? As I said, the the most important thing with this kind of stuff is you need to have like a easy guideline of how to set up without having to switch to Google. And this is not the case with most of the tools because you have to be like, okay, how do I write this? How do I write that? So be the tool itself being the documentation that tells you what to do when um, is a huge um, win because depending on project, but the CICD pipelines are usually tools for the developers and developers aren't usually the ones that are uh, knowledgeable about the YAML syntax of each CICD pipeline or want to even uh, work with that. So I think it makes a huge sense to have this UI driven, like easy to configure intuitive uh, thing. And as you said, uh, there are so many features and so many things that CICD pipelines can do, which is amazing. But in most projects, you may need just 80% of it, or at least to get started, you just need 80% and kind of slimming that down uh, in the UI that tells you, you this is what, what you need to get started. Um, instead of worrying about these powerful additional features, uh, that's also a huge bonus. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Because features, I mean, there, there's plenty of features, but just to get started, you know, yeah. nice and simple, nice and easy. Well, I'll tell you what, Nana, thank you very much for giving Pipelines a try. And um, let's continue with our next section, so to speak. Our last section is about, uh, it's called rapid fire. I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions and uh, I would like you to answer with one or two or three words. No long answers, just, you know, short answers, whatever comes to your mind. Uh, and we're just going to give it a go, yeah? Let's do it. Okay. Um, Windows, Linux or Mac OS? Mac OS. Mac OS, okay. 100%. <laughs> uh, vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream? Vanilla with chocolate, both. Mixed. Good, good, good answer. <laughs> Next one, uh, Kinkali or Wiener Schnitzel? Oh, Kinkali. Okay, that, that came quick, that came quick. Um, Kubernetes or Ansible? Kubernetes. Right, have you uh, ever over worked any with... Tool. Uh, over any tool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kubernetes versus X, always Kubernetes. Right. Uh, one thing you love the most about, you know, let's say being a DevOps engineer, about the whole DevOps field? The complexity. 
complexity. One thing you hate the most about the DevOps uh, field. The complexity. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most common mistake uh, a DevOps engineer makes. What's the most common mistake? Thinking about tools and not about concepts. Yeah. yeah. Right. Starting with tools instead of concepts. Instead of concepts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, what was the most challenging situation in your career so far? Uh, working as a Kubernetes administrator and learning and, and doing everything at the same time. Yeah, that was, that was the most challenging. Would you like sharing your biggest maybe success and also your biggest fail? If there was such a like thing? Like generally in life? Yeah, I mean, career-wise, I mean, uh, tech-wise. <laughs> The biggest fail was probably the two startups that I tried to uh, build before the YouTube channel. Um, and YouTube channel was the, the biggest success, like generally the, the building the whole community, because I think it's not just the numbers, because you can have 1 million subscribers on YouTube channel, but the community maybe like just whatever, like they're kind of interested. Um, usually this happens if you have like entertainment uh, content versus education. So having that a number for education content where people are invested at watching like 40, 50 minute uh, tutorials, I think that that is quality added to the quantity. So I think it is a huge success. It is. One improvement you'd like to see happen in the whole DevOps community or industry? So I'm split on it. I would love to see the, the trend towards making things standard. So not each project and team trying to decide which tools that they need to use, they should cho choose from, because there are 10 things that do the same thing. But on the other side, I'm also I'm split because I like the fact that there are so many tools and so many varieties and, and things because it, it makes it more interesting. So, but I think it's gonna happen naturally over the years where things get kind of standard. So when you, when you start a project, you kind of know this is the tool set that we're gonna use because you know, for this, this is the main tool. For this, this is the main, main tool. Kind of like what happened with Docker and Kubernetes. I feel now we strayed away from the from the simple short answer to, <laughs> to long answer. Yeah. That's certainly fine. Um, one trend, one hype you're currently excited about in the whole of IT, and please don't say AI. I, I do not like AI, actually. I'm, I mean, I don't mind it, and I think it, it has its uh, path, so to say. But, like, we did a couple of videos, and I was like, oh, do we have to? to think about AI, but yeah, people want to hear about it. So I don't have very strong feelings about that. I think platform engineering is the most exciting thing for me. Do you, by the way, see a lot of AI being put into the whole DevOps field at the moment? That oh yes. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's really funny because every tool, every company tries to push like AI into whatever. Uh, my experience is that um, it doesn't work as well as, it, as you would expect it. So it, it's not as mature as um, uh, people may think. So it's not usable, so to say. Um, I, I know that it's gonna develop eventually to the place where it's gonna be usable, um, but I mean, yeah, you should start somewhere, right? Um, what do you think is the biggest misconception about DevOps? Probably that it's about um, a combination of tools and technologies, because when the, the questions that I got, get asked by people who want to get into DevOps is, which tools should I learn? Like, oh, should I start with Kubernetes or Ansible or Terraform? I think that's the misconception because you should start by understanding what DevOps is and then the conceptual stuff. And then you, you can start thinking about, because Kubernetes is just, Kubernetes in the background is also just a set of concepts. Um, and if you have another tool that solves them better, then that's going to be the, the ne next new thing, so to say. What's the best piece of advice you ever received? Could be DevOps, could be IT, could be anything. Um, I think it was from a business world. Um, that So the, the wording exactly is everything is figure outable, which for me was like, yeah, that's, that sounds cool, actually. And it applies to everything, whether it's complex technology or business or life. Last question. What do you like to do when you don't sit in front of the PC? Is there anything <laughs> you'd like to do? I mean, as, as kind of a balance or I mean... Travel, that is my biggest thing. So whenever I'm sitting for six or seven hours and working on a tool and it doesn't work, the, the biggest relief for me is to go on booking.com or some travel platforms and check out like the next destinations and book a holiday.
the second last question is munich gonna be your next destination <laughs> travel destination maybe <laughs> maybe yeah Thank you very much. I would love to see you in Munich. I would love to see you um, again. And it was a pleasure talking with you um, with, with all the, the information you gave us. And um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks.